bold. Trump is brave and he is bold. Washington says can't build no wall. Washington says can't build no wall. Trump's gonna build it bigger and tall. Trump's gonna build it bigger and tall. Three cheers for our Supreme Judicial Court decision about, and it goes like this. It says court officers and local officials do not have authority under state law to hold illegal aliens on a ship. We believe then, and we still believe now, and we're going to continue to believe. But the idea is, don't let the naysayers get you down. They'll always try to bring you down. They'll always try to tell you that you're wrong, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to do it. Don't believe it for a minute. Because we have a man in the White House now who's the equivalent of, who's more or less an Andrew Jackson in County, a Teddy, a Teddy Roosevelt in County. And they were with us. The common sense of the American people would prevail. The people in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, in Ohio, in Indiana, in Wisconsin, in states that we hadn't won in a generation, the Rust Belt, the Farm Belt, Middle America, they were with us, and we knew that they'd be with us. We also knew that the elites wouldn't be with us, and we didn't care. Because they we will bring this country back under my watch, whether you like it or not. It's coming back. Yeah. To kill us. So the president, his number one job is to protect us, and he does. So what does Maura Healy do? She runs over to the federal district court and files for an injunction against Trump. She wants to stop that. Can you imagine the nuttiness of this woman? Our public safety is at risk. And she has Trump derangement syndrome. She wants to go for political expediency and stop the president's plan. Now, you would think that the attorney general of any state would be very concerned for the public safety of their citizens. But Maura Healy, she went in, and this was her argument before the court. She said that the president is violating, get this now, violating the civil rights of those foreign nationals. They have a right to be here. She said that. That's how many is it. She said they have a civil right to be here. No, they don't. The president is violating it. goes one step further. She also said President Trump is violating their First Amendment right. No, he's not! Because he's using <laughs> the religious test against them because they're Muslims. Now, can I ask you something? Isn't it a little hypocritical that this woman is using civil rights as a reason when she trampled all over us at Second Amendment rights? That's how nutty she is. Put the word military industrial academic complex, a Democrat. Elizabeth Warren, Charlie Baker, the Republicans and Democrats are the face of that. And that's what Trump is fighting. Trump is not a Republican, let's be honest. Trump hijacked the Republican Party because he needed that platform, because they would never let anyone come. Now, in Massachusetts, they've gotten a lot smarter. Charlie Baker does not want to see a guy like me, doesn't want to see us hijacking that party. That's why I'm running as an independent. And the reason I'm running as an independent is because there's 2.3 million people who shoot. The greatest things in the world. These people hate him. But all he does is basically been uh, doing the right thing for us. Okay? Discuss, Brianna Wu. They refer to him as she and her. We know this is just more gaslighting from exactly the same people who have been gaslighting us since Pilot's Day. But like Pontius Pilate, we just, we reckon that the safest thing to do is to go along with it. Folks, we are not going to make America great again by going along with these lies, by playing along with the lies of America's enemies. How many of you are familiar with the whole Sanctuary State, Sanctuary City initiative, right? So what does that mean? What that says is, People like that, even the mayor of Boston here, if you dare, if you dare to come here illegally, we're going to protect you. In the sanctuary city, in the sanctuary state, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to 
work to let you come out of the shadows. Now think about this. Come out of the shadows and you will not be held accountable for what you're doing. We're going to give you cover. We won't let local law enforcement contact ICE and tell them that you're here. We'll do everything we can to prevent, give you cover. <laughs> Juxtapose this issue. Here we are, three weeks ago now, we've got an attorney general in California, we've got a mayor in Oakland, California saying, you illegals who are here, come on out, we're gonna provide you cover and sanctuary, but you legal residents and citizens of the United States, we want you to go into the shadows and do not work with law enforcement to keep your communities and your businesses safe and your families free from harm. That is not America, ladies and gentlemen. That is not the America that Donald Trump is talking about, and it's not the America that we want. And following Sheriff Hodgson in Massachusetts, like Bill Belichick, and he is going out of town. You know, uh, Rahm Emanuel, it's, pre it's pretty well known by all of us in America that Rahm Emanuel uh, has really little regard for the for the uh, the, the laws and, and, uh, and citizenship the, that uh, that he's quick to say that anybody who who um, comes here illegally and he never uses the word illegal always says immigrants uh, and you'll find that mostly when the pro illegal people are arguing their points they'll say well we're we're a pro immigrant. Uh, city or community, as Rahm Emanuel often does. But the truth of the matter is, even he's dishonest in that regard. He can't even he can't even be honest in, in, in articulating what he's really talking about because he knows that it's wrong. So he continues to try to uh, advance his political agenda, as many of them do, to try to garner votes with the immigrant community by thinking he's going to help those who are here illegally and somehow perhaps still be related to some of the immigrants who are there, there legally in his city um, and get their votes, but. But we didn't, we didn't elect people like Rahm Emanuel to take care of themselves. We got elected them to take care of the people of their communities. Look at the gun violence going on there. I mean, he's, he's talking about protecting people that come here illegally. And, and uh, what about the people that are dying in, his, in the streets, in his community? Gang violence and all these things going on. Uh, if he didn't uh, work so hard to try to provide benefits for people who really don't have a right to be here and didn't follow our rules and respect our laws, he probably have a lot more money to be able to take care of the other problems that he's not addressing in his own own city, and sadly at the expense of American lives. Um, well, just in, uh, on that note, just what, at what point is, is can government like this is affecting the whole country, the, these sanctuary cities and everything, with like you said, national security, safety. But now it's going to be it's creeping into our elect electoral process. And it, I mean, many have already proven that it has already, but this is going to be now it's like full official. So at what point is what what point does the federal government step in and start well, doing something? Well, you know, that's a that's a great question. And I think it's now uh, I've had conversations with the attorney general about a number of things where I think that the federal government ought to step up, not the least of which is uh, arresting people uh, who are in elective office who decide to harbor and conceal people that are in this country illegally or someone like Rahm Emanuel who's trying to find a way to let people vote legally who don't have a right to even vote uh, by giving them this this card that doesn't isn't backed up with legitimate uh, documentation and that's that's it's consistent with the fact that they don't want voter registration in this country for a reason why wouldn't you want honest elections so th th we all know and the people have started to figure it out in America and people like Rahm Emanuel are going to find out pretty soon that the American people are going to stand up they're going to continue to stand up stand behind this president to reinvent, reinvent the rule of law in a way that it's going to be followed by everybody and those who violate it are going to fa face the consequences yeah, it's uh, Jay Dwyer, and we're with the uh, March for Trump event in Boston today from uh, noon to 3 o'clock on the State House steps. Um, are, are you worried about any counter-protests causing any trouble? or we, we kind of expect it, but we've already contacted the Boston Police and the Massachusetts State Police. They've been very receptive, and they, their points were really simple. They said, we just want everybody to play in the same sandbox with no trouble. That's nice. That's that's what America's about, right? Freedom of speech. And freedom of speech, exactly. Uh, also, Second Amendment, I heard you were going to be discussing, having a speaker discuss the Second Amendment. Um, do you want to make any comments about, in, in light of the Florida event and the uh, different uh, calls on Capitol Hill, you want to make any comments about that? Yeah, regarding the, the uh, First and Second Amendment, 
thank God we're here. We have the First Amendment, so we have the right to speak. And the Second Amendment ensures our, all the other amendments because the reason we had it initially and still is to protect us from the government. Because if the government is, uh, if the people are afraid of the government, you have tyranny. If the government's afraid of the people, you have freedom. Any country you go to. And dictators, the first thing they do is they take away the guns. So that's the basic position, and it's specifically about the uh, Florida shooting or any other mass shootings. Anywhere from 24 to, to 50 of the, uh, 24 to, to 30 of the mass shooters, I believe there are 25 or 26. Every single one of them was under some sort of psychotropic drugs. Now, they all had guns, but the, the gun didn't do the damage, the people did. And I think we have a problem with mental health, a big problem. A part of it's been exacerbated by HIPAA, you know, the privacy rights. So if somebody wants to buy a gun, to, from my, this is just my perspective, if somebody wants to buy a gun, then their background should be opened, you know, to, and they should have a statement in there, very clear, very simple. Is this person a threat of danger to themselves or to other people? And if that's the case, they should not be allowed to have a gun. So that would solve a lot. The other thing is, the schools are gun-free zones. We have to harden them up. We protect everything that's valuable to us, we protect with guns. We protect banks, we protect jewelry stores, we protect all our politicians. Are our children less important to us than that? They're the most valuable asset we have, the continuity of our American system. So we should protect them. As far as teachers having guns, teachers are humans. Not every human should have a gun, not every teacher should have a gun. Only people who want them should do it and who are trained properly. Not just to hit a target, but to work under high stress situations with a lot of people around. It's a different sort of training. I was hoping to get so, your uh, comments on the uh, recent uh, Florida tragedy and uh, maybe discuss maybe all the, what's going on on Capitol Hill about the Second Amendment and uh, sure. different legislation there. Uh, look, when the Founding Fathers uh, put the Second Amendment together, the fundamental notion was that you know the British were essentially abusing the rights of people. So the notion was that we have the right to protect ourselves. First Amendment, we, we should be able to speak what we want, and then the Second Amendment. Now the Florida tragedy, when you really start looking at this, in my opinion, we really need to start looking at the culture of violence that's taking place you know, in the United States. And to just focus on you know, the use of guns, that may be one part of it, you know, whatever, people shouldn't have missiles at home or RPGs, okay? Um, but there's a, there's a larger issue. You know, I'm a system scientist. I don't look at problems in an individual way. Politicians do that, and they do what's uh, opportunistic for themselves. But when you look at this whole issue, you know, I actually, probably the only uh, guy who's looking at data, and I, in fact, downloaded the last hundred shootings, and I have a spreadsheet, and I'm actually going through it in a very meticulous way. And some very interesting observations. One of the things you see, there was, many of these kids were on psychotropic drugs. That's just a fact. Not all of them, but a significant number of them. A number of them play video games, and this is something that's a very controversial thing, right? Uh, I look at it again as a biologist, you know, what you put in your mouth affects your epigenetics. What you see affects your epigenetics and what you hear. We don't know enough about images and sound. Uh, you know, in the traditional uh, systems of medicine, certain sounds were really powerful for healing and other sounds were very disturbing. Uh, certain images, right? Now if a kid is uh, playing eight hours of video games and he's on psychotropic drugs and he doesn't have parental support, what kind of epigenetics does that create for that individual? My issues we don't know, right? But we do know that we have a culture of violence in this country. When I was growing up in the United States in the 70s, there was a lot of guns, more like here. You didn't see all these school shootings. So something significant has changed, and if we simply go address one issue, which is what politicians like to do, and we don't address all the other issues, um, the synergistic issues here, you're gonna, kids are going to start building dynamite maybe. Maybe they'll start poisoning the school cafeteria. And that's what we need to go address. Um, and that's what I'll, I'll do. You know, I'm an inventor scientist. I'm not a politician. Uh, you know, I look at things in a holistic way, and that's what engineers do. Politicians look things as what's opportunistic for them. So that's the way I look at the gun control issue. Uh, that's an excellent way to approach it, I'd say. Um, as far as uh, systems go, I, I, I know there's a lot of talk going on about in California. There's um, the attorney general was, or the, the mayor was uh, warned of ICE raids and um, kind of going against the uh, systems that are in place to protect Americans from 
uh, different things like MS gangs like MS-13 coming over the border doing uh, business, you know, illicit business attack. Uh, I was just hoping to get your comment on that. Yeah, look, you know, this issue with gangs, drugs, uh, opioid addiction, all this stuff is what I call has been going on for a long time. You know, when I was in D.C., uh, in fact, I, I met a DEA agent who's been in the business for 30 years. He goes, look, the level of collusion that goes on, um, we need to look at. You know, politicians and uh, career politicians make money off drugs. You know, uh, I mean, you can look at it in a very simple way. Uh, uh, Romney, for example, aggregated all the opio uh, methadone clinics and flipped them and made about, for, for Bain, around three quarters of a billion dollars, right? So there's a whole swamp economy that runs. Um, I frankly believe if people really wanted to stop drugs, crossing the boards would happen overnight. And uh, I think when you look at the fact how much news is made out of it, uh, that you start realizing what's really going on here. You know, is there an intention to keep people lulled? Is there an intent? How, how much money is flowing on this? You're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars. So there's a reason that people allow these drugs to flow in. Um, and I think we, we, we're not stupid people, you know? So if we again just isolate the issue to one thing and, and start realizing that there's a collusion between uh, MS-13, likely, and there's probably a collusion with those people who claim they want to take out MS-13. So I think we need to start, you know, Americans are getting smart. Uh, the Trump election, forget Donald Trump, the individual, it's really an anti-establishment movement. And I think people are getting much, much smarter about it. So I think when you look at drugs, when you look at gang violence, uh, you know, what made this country great was a rule of law and meritocracy. And when you have politicians, you know, some of them who are now fake Trumpers, some of them who wear MAGA hats today, yesterday they were supporting guys like Ted Cruz, a guy like Dirty Deal, or like Charlie Baker or like uh, Beth Lindstrom, you know, these people are really in many ways insidious people who play both sides of the game and do what's opportunistic. And that's really the real issue here. The uh, opiate uh, crisis that's going on, specifically hitting uh, hard in Boston and the surrounding area. Um, what Do you see any relation with that, uh, with the immigration policies of the sanctuary cities? Um, and because I, I do know that MS-13 uh, has a, a pretty big operation um, bringing drugs over the border and uh, as Attorney General you know what would you hope to uh, do about about just cleaning up the whole crisis in general well I'll tell you what um, the opiate crisis as I had said earlier it's a curse and it has hit every family in the Commonwealth it has also hit my own family I lost my oldest son to the opiate crisis so I'm uh, uh, it's very dear to my heart uh, uh, I, I tell people I got a little something in this game uh, because of that and uh, the opiate crisis tackling the opiate crisis is really my number one priority uh, a lot of people are saying well you know he's just a gun guy he's just a gun guy well I'm a Second Amendment guy but I am a guy for civil rights but getting back to your original question about is there a connection between uh, sanctuary cities here's the connection the connection is that Law enforcement under uh, mayors who have sanctuary cities or like Maura Healy who is uh, operating her office as if Massachusetts is a sanctuary state. Now some say well how can she do that? Well she's elected by the people, it's a constitutional office, in other words she sets the law enforcement policy for the state uh, and she doesn't answer to the governor um, because she's separately elected. So it's a constitutional office. Now, w the connection is, and you just mentioned one about uh, MS-13, but the connection is when you have a top official, a top law enforcement official, in this case the highest law enforcement official, uh, state law enforcement official, the Attorney General, who is literally sheltering illegal aliens, we got a, we got a strong issue, we got a problem here. Now, is there a connection? Yes, there is. Because President Trump knows, well actually everybody in the nation knows, that uh, fentanyl and heroin, they're not manufactured in New England. Uh, fentanyl comes from China, uh, heroin comes from Afghanistan, and they both come through the Mexico border. So uh, the President knows that, 
All the feds know that, and that's why they want to build the wall. It's going to be for two reasons. Everybody focuses just on the fact that it's going to curb illegal immigration, but it's also going to stop the drug flow because the drugs are flowing over the border. Now, the federal agencies know that. ICE knows it. Custom knows it. DEA knows it. The Border Patrol knows it. They all know it. The, the FBI knows it. Everybody knows how those drugs are getting into New England and into Massachusetts. But when Maura Healy declares the, the, the state as a sanctuary state, and you have cities that declaring themselves as sanctuary cities, they are refusing to deal with the federal law enforcement assets. And they're doing it for political expediency because they don't they're shielding segments of the population. So when you say, I'm not going to deal, when, 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 a, when a government official says, we're not going to deal with and cooperate with federal authorities, and their reason is for political expediency, they're going to protect illegal aliens, this should be an insult to every taxpayer, especially in this state in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We're paying for those federal assets, and those federal assets could help us in drying up the source. 80% of the opiate deaths in Massachusetts are from heroin and fentanyl. Now, I gotta tell you something, if that's the case, her top priority should be cooperating with federal assets, doing joint task force, and cleaning this up and drying up that source. She's not doing that. So is there a connection between illegal immigration, as you, your, your previous question was, uh, illegal immigration and the flow of drugs? The answer is absolutely there is, there's a direct connection. Uh, in regards to uh, just enforcing the laws, really, uh, how, how would we expect to, in Massachusetts, expect to uh, change the chide of uh, people just obeying the laws? Because apparently people in Massachusetts, specifically with the uh, immigration issues, because um, that is, falls under federal purview, but, uh, and we have to respect states' rights, but, I mean, how, how would we go about um, just, how would you go about uh, finagling the whole issues between that? Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, I'd start enforcing the law like we expect our Attorney General to do. Um, when I get inaugurated, assuming I'm going to win and I intend to win, I'm going to be taking an oath of office. In that oath of, oath of office, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to, to take an oath that I will uphold the Constitution of the United States and the laws thereunder. Now, just ending it right there would be fine, but I'm also going to take an oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the laws thereunder. There is no law now that says we, uh, that, that's, that, that officials, elected officials in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has to refuse to cooperate with our federal counterparts. It's just the opposite. We're required to. So what is Maura Healy doing? She is conspiring. This is a conspiracy to obstruct justice. When you say you're going to do this, and her stated reason is to protect illegal aliens, by being illegal aliens, that's, that's a violation of the law. And when she goes to protect them, she is conspiring with them to violate our laws. Now, that's a criminal offense. In any other place, that's a criminal offense. But because she is the state's top law enforcement official, Nobody apparently is willing to uh, charge her with uh, any kind of a crime. Now, uh, but to going on a little bit further, you said, so what, what are we going to do or what would I do? Well, what I would do is I would establish task forces, joint state and federal task forces, to go after the opiates and clean them up, all the illegal opiates, especially the heroin and fentanyl, which I, like I had said earlier, 80% of the deaths by opiate addiction is because of heroin and fentanyl. I, I would do that. I would also institute extreme um, prosecution. Extreme prosecution is a little different and it's the opposite of what Maura Healy is doing. Maura Healy is on record as saying that the Massachusetts sentencing guidelines for people who are convicted of drug trafficking and drug distribution are too harsh. I say they're not harsh enough. My whole uh, approach is to have extreme prosecution. In other words, drive them out of Massachusetts. Make it so difficult for them to 
to sell their poison here to our loved ones in Massachusetts that they will just pick up and go out and go to another state with more lenient laws. I don't care how they get out, if we, how, we, how they get out of business, either going in other states or we put them in jail. But the whole point is our number one job is to protect uh, public safety. And that's what I would do. So, so I would do that. I would cooperate with the federal authorities by joint ta task forces. And uh, look at the whole, the whole point is our government officials have to obey the law or else you'll have a complete breakdown in society. Although we are each sovereign states, we are all part of the, of the uh, United States. And so the federal constitution gives us rights, but it also gives us responsibilities. And I will uphold both. Um, so upholding the law, um, there was a Massachusetts state, uh, I believe she was a representative, um, who had warned of the ICE raids last year, early 2017, um, would, would those people be prosecuted as well for... Okay, that's interesting because um, I know you're talking about the uh, state representative from Brockton who called up her constituents and says ICE is about to uh, conduct some raids, don't answer the door, that sort of a thing. Uh, we also have the uh, mayor of Oakland, California doing the same thing. All right, now here's, here's, here's the, um, this is where the law uh, has some fine points to it. Um, she has to know that ICE is going after individuals, certain individuals, not that they're in the neighborhood. Um, anybody can tell people that police cruisers are in the neighborhood. Uh, for whatever reason, there seem to be more in the neighborhood. Um, we, anybody could say that ICE is coming even if they're not. If she had specific information, uh, for instance, there was some detainers that ICE had, and she knew the names on it, and she was calling those people, now that would be a violation of law. But what she did, although it was despicable, what she did, um, it wasn't, it doesn't rise to the, it doesn't go beyond the First Amendment for her to say stuff, even if it isn't true. It doesn't, it doesn't go beyond that and become criminal. It would be criminal if there was specific details that she was given saying, they're planning to come to your house at 123 Main Street. You better leave now while you can. I seen the warrant. Now that would do it, but that isn't the case here. I, I, I mean, I just know for a fact that wasn't the case here. That was just a state rep uh, thinking she was doing something by just broadcasting it and the way she broadcasted it wasn't wasn't the wasn't the type of thing that mounts to that amounts to or rises to the level of a conspiracy. Purpose okay. uh, nationwide, there's marches for Trump going on. Washington D.C., New York, uh, the one in Austin, Texas, had a huge following yesterday. Joey Gibson, Haley Adams, Black Rebel were all down there. Uh, man, these rallies have to keep happening throughout uh, Trump's presidency. He needs to know that instead of just any mass protests against anything that he does, even breathing. Uh, we need to be out here and show our support for our president, and I think it serves its purpose. Uh, the issues that were discussed today, particularly, uh, the, there was a lot of Second Amendment talk, but as well as the opiates and the uh, immigration and stuff. Um, are you happy the way you see things handling, uh, being handled by the Trump leadership? Or? Uh, I am happy. Um, I agree with uh, Trump, like he's doing some uh, prison reform kind of thing, helping... Um, wants to help offenders when they get out of jail uh, assimilate to a normal life again. And uh, he's even recommending the uh, death penalty for uh, heroin dealers, so I can definitely get behind that. Um, in other, uh, as far as immigration, um, I think that he knew what the Democrats were doing. He gave them an offer for twice the, twice the amount of people that DACA even covers. And uh, they completely denied it, and it just shows that, and it was even leaked, it was even leaked that they only care about DACA because it, it's the key to their future electoral success. And I think when that comes back into into debate talks, like Trump is firm, like end chain migration, end the visa lottery, build the wall, all that. And he's, he's, he's staying true to his word. I mean, he does these little like 4D chess moves where he says like, well, I, you know, I care about them and all that stuff, but it's just to show the left that they really don't want him to accomplish anything. Um, his, his comments, recent comments, uh, with about the second amendment with the, um, about after the, I don't know if you saw those, there were a lot of controversy about Trump's comments. Uh, did you have any concerns about that or? No, I don't. 
it's just, uh, just another 4D chess move. Another 4D chess. All right. Um, and did you want to add anything else? Or? No. Uh, March 24th was this Marxism is taken to Boston to expose that bullshit march that they're having. March for our lives as uh, the pro-choice pro -choice people decided to care about children all of a sudden. Like how many kids have uh, Planned Parenthood has killed compared to an AR-15? The numbers don't even compare. And uh, it's backed by George Soros. They're using it for DNC electoral success. They're backed by Planned Parenthood, dude. It's, it's a bunch of bullshit. And um, like they're uh, they come in like they they're censoring conservatives on on every media platform, and now they want to take away guns from law-abiding citizens. We're going to be out there. We're going to expose all that nonsense. And then it's going to lead up to the June 2nd rally, where we have nationwide rallies planned for uh, to defend our uh, right to bear arms. Shall not be infringed. And if the government wants to take it, they're going to take it from my cold, dead hands.